it's that time of the year where I can remind you about final exam dates. So, uh, you know, final, your, your scheduled final exam is on May 12th. I got the times wrong, so I want to make sure everybody gets this right. It's 10 to 12 on May 12th is the actual final exam. I know a few of you have to leave earlier. In fact, quite a few, looking at the Google spreadsheet, already filled out. And there is an early final on May 10th from 10 to 12, and I'll, in the room number is specified in the Google. So make sure you sign up because there are only 60 seats in that room. And don't do it preemptively just in case you might need a spot because that's not fair. So do it only if you really need to get out of here by May 11th for whatever reason. So there is an early final May 10th. There's a regularly scheduled final May 12th. They're two different finals. So I can't guarantee that they will be equally difficult, equally easy, whatever. No. So just on the table. The second is I did send out that, that link to all the stuff for the project in one place because I know it's kind of overwhelming because you have this list of things to do and you're saying, where should I get started? And I can tell you at the very beginning, but that sounds kind of not quite correct. So basically I collected all the resources. They're all in one page. So basically you can see all the links to the data sets, the spreadsheets, the, the in-practice videos that I've been sending out every week. So get started on the project if you haven't already, and if you're already on the project, kind of, it's not as much work as it looks, because at first sight, it looks like a bunch of tasks, but actually you're going to see as you do one task, you're actually accomplishing tasks that are useful for other purposes as well. So today we're actually going to almost complete the capital structure section, because if we think about where we are right now, we have the optimal debt ratio for a company, using the cost of capital approach, the adjusted present value approach, or just by looking at everybody else in the sector. We looked at why your optimal may be high or low, looking at your tax rate, you know, how much cash flow you have. Today, we're going to, I'm going to call this my action day. Today, we're going to talk about, so what? So what if you're under levered or over levered? Should you do something about it right away? And if you decide to do something about it, what's the best way of getting your company from where it is today to where, you, where it should be? So we're going to focus in on this box, which is, what's the right kind of debt for you? Should you go out and borrow money today? Should you pay off existing debt? So let's set the table. Okay? If you think about where we are in the process, we have an optimal debt ratio for a company. So if you've done your optimal, think about your company rather than thinking about Disney or Baidu or my companies. Think about your company. Think about the optimal debt ratio you got for your company. And then... There are three things that are possible. So when you look at your company, you look at the optimal, look at the actual three possibilities. The first is your company has the right amount of debt. In which case, what should you do? Heave a sigh of relief. This section is pretty much done for the moment and move on. The other two possibilities, your company has too little debt or too much debt, under levered or over levered. We've talked about what kind of problem is a better problem to have. It's far better to have too little debt. It's easier to fix than too much debt. So the next step in the process is figuring out what to do about that optimal. And there are two questions I want to answer today. One is, assuming that your company is under-levered or over-levered, how quickly or gradually can you move to the optimal? How big of a problem is this that you need to fix right away? And assuming you decide to move towards the optimal, what's the right kind of financing for you to get there? So if you're under-levered, what's the right kind of debt? If you're over-levered, you know, what, what's a way of raising equity to bring the debt down? So let's look at the process. I have a framework that I find useful for getting from the actual to the optimal. Let me lay out the framework because it's pretty much going to cover every company in this class. So somewhere in this framework, your company should be there. So the framework starts by asking a very simple question. Is my company under or over lever? To make that judgment, you have to have a measure of the optimal. Using whatever approach you've decided, is it under lever or over lever? Let's take the easier problem first. Let's assume your company has too, much, too little debt. It's under level. First question you need to ask as a follow-up is, is my company potentially the target of a takeover? Maybe a hostile takeover. So let me ask you a question. Why would having too little debt make you a potential target for a takeover? What is it that makes you attractive to acquirers? Yes, sir. Uh, and continue the thoughts. So you have a lot of free assets. So what, oh, Think from the acquirer's perspective, why does it make it easier for him? 
So in other words, this is almost unnatural, right? An acquirer is using your assets to borrow money and then use it to buy you out. I'll give you an analogy. It's not going to go all the way through, but kind of hang in there anyway. Let's assume you buy a house in the New York area, even with housing prices you know, kind of flattening out. It will cost you about a million dollars. And unless you're a drug dealer, you probably have to borrow money to buy the house. So let's say you borrow $800,000, you buy this million dollar house. And then you're extraordinarily frugal. Every month you save enough money, it has to be a lot of money, to pay off all the debt in five years. So now you own the only all equity financed house in your entire neighborhood. You have a mortgage burning party. Have you heard of these? In the old days when people actually used to live in the same house and they had 30 year mortgages, they actually paid off the 30 year mortgage after 30 years and then they'd have a party. They'd invite all the neighbors over, coffee cakes, orange juice, and they'd celebrate. Once in a while they'd burn the house down with the, you know, but, but let's say you decide to have this mortgage burning party and they physically actually burn the mortgage papers to say, hey, I'm free now. So you decide to have a mortgage burning. You decide to invite all your neighbors, including your neighbor Bob, who's never liked you. He doesn't like the way you cut your grass. He doesn't like the shrubs you pick. He doesn't like your kids. But he shows up anyway because it's free food. And while he's sitting there eating your coffee cake and drinking your orange juice, he's plotting his revenge. So after the party, here's what he does. He goes to the friendly neighborhood bank. And he says, look, there's a million dollar house with no debt on it. Would you lend me $800,000 against that house? What's the banker going to say? It's not your house, it's your neighbor's house. You can't go around borrowing on your neighbor's houses, but this is your friendly neighborhood banker. He says, no problem, Bob, here's $800,000. Now, Bob has $800,000 he's borrowed using your house as collateral. He does a hostile acquisition of your house. I don't know how this would work out. He approaches your kids and says, hey kids, would you like your own basement all for yourself? Just sell your share of the house to me. And he acquires 51% of your house and throws you out on the street. Thank God this can't happen with the house. But let's make the house into a publicly traded company. Let's give the publicly traded company a billion dollar value and an $800 million capacity to borrow money. Let's say you are the CEO of this publicly traded company and you're very conservative. You hate borrowing money, so you don't borrow money. So you now have a billion dollar company with no debt. I'm an acquirer, I see your company. I go to the friendly neighborhood bank, I try the same trick I tried in the house. Can you lend me 800 million against that company? What's the banker going to say? No, it's not your company. And until, two th until 1980, this would have been the end of the story. The 1980s, Mike Milken and Drexel Burnham changed the rules of the game. What did Mike Milken and Drexel Burnham create that did not exist until they came along? What is it? No, this is pre-leveraged buyout. This actually had to happen for leveraged buyout to happen. Junk, it, it, the, the traditional answer we get is it's a junk bond market. Junk bond markets actually existed pre-1981, but pre-1981, the way you became a junk bond is you started investment grade and you slid. What Mike Milken and Drexel Burnham created was an original issue junk bond market. What did that mean? You could actually be a single B rated issue and go out and issue bonds. Pre-1980, you could not do that. If you were not investment grade, going to the market and raising debt at that lower rating was not done. Mike Milken said, why not? If you pay a high enough interest rate, they will come. So you have an original issue. So how does this help me as an acquirer? What do I do? I go to the junk bond market and say, look, I'd like to borrow money on a company I don't own. I have no assets to back it up. I will pay you a 12, 15, 18% interest rate because there's no backing. I will issue unsecured debt and using your assets as collateral, I borrow $800 million, paying a high interest rate on it. Then what do I do? I do a hostile acquisition of your company. Now you're a very conservative CEO, right? So in addition to not borrowing money, what have you very conveniently accumulated in your company for me? What do conservative CEOs like to accumulate? A lot of cash, so you have 400 million in cash. So here's what I do, right after I finish your acquisition, I take your cash and pay off the debt I borrowed using your assets as backing. It can't get any sweeter than this. You made my life incredibly easy. So if you are an under-levered company, that's my first stop, is I have to make sure that you're not under immediate danger 
of a hostile takeover. And here are three things you might want to look at. The first is you might want to look at the size of your company. Why? What if I told you Microsoft was under levered? What are you going to do about it? It's a $250 billion company. Doing a hostile acquisition of a $250 billion company is not impossible, but it's really, really difficult. So the larger the company, the more you can get away being under-levered because people are not going to exactly do a hostile acquisition of a $250 billion company. So that's the first thing I'm going to look at. And the threshold for big has actually had to get higher and higher. There was a point in time where if you were a $10 billion company, people said you're too big. Now that number's become 50, 60, 80 billion because people are able to raise enough capital even to go after companies with tens of billions of market value. The second question I'm going to look at is who owns the stock in this company? You're saying, why should I care? If I try to take over Microsoft in addition to having to come up with a lot of cash, what's my second barrier to taking it over? What do I have to do? There are insiders in the company like Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer. They're not exactly lining up to sell their shares to me. So you're already going to see that if they own 20, 25 percent, if insiders own 20, 25 percent of the company, you will now have to buy 51 percent of the remaining 80 percent, a much tougher task than buying 51 percent of 100 percent. So I'm going to look at how big you are as a company. The bigger you are as a company, the more difficult it is to, to, to do a takeover. I'm going to look at who owns shares in the company. And that HDS page we've looked at for, for other reasons is now going to come into play. And the third question I'm going to ask is how well or badly has your stock done? And here's why. Every hostile acquisition is a fight between two sides. On the one side is the hostile acquirer. On the other side is the incumbent manager of the company. And in the middle, for once in your lives, you're the stockholders, and both sides are trying to get your attention. So you're the shareholders. The hostile acquirer says, don't trust the managers. They don't care about you. And the managers say, don't trust the hostile acquirer. He's going to ruin the company. And you get to decide who to trust. Let me tilt the scales a little bit. Let's assume your stock has gone down 80% over the last five years. Who are you going to trust? You're going to look at the man and say, why should I trust you? Look what you've done to my company. So I'm going to look, and this is the third factor I'm going to consider, is how well or badly have you done as a company after adjusting for the market and after adjusting for risk? Does it sound mildly familiar how well or badly has your stock done after adjusting for the market and adjusting for risk? Is this something we've measured already that's going to allow us to, to get that? Remember that Jensen's Alpha way, way back in time? That Jensen's Alpha is now going to come into play because I'm going to look at it and say, you've done really badly for me, therefore I'm more likely to trust the acquirer. So here's your trifecta. If you're an under-levered company and you're small to mid-size in terms of market cap, you have very little insider holdings, and your Jensen's Alpha looks like a big negative number. Don't waste time plotting five-year plans. You've got to do something quickly. What does that mean? You've got to increase your debt ratio quickly, essentially overnight. And here are, here are a couple of ways you can accomplish it. You can go out and borrow money and buy back stock. And think of why that changes your debt, debt ratio overnight. Borrowing money pushes up debt. Buying back stock pushes down equity. You can increase your debt ratio from 10 to 50% 50, 50 in, in, in a week, in, in 10 days. You can even try what's called a debt for equity swap if you're a really small company. And what that is, is you go to equity investors in your company who are planning to sell your stock anyway and buy bonds, and you offer them corporate bonds in the company of equivalent market value. You're not trying to pull a fast one. You're saying, look, we want to increase our debt ratio. We can give you bonds of equivalent market value. Again, you're adjusting the debt ratio quickly. So if you're under threat of a hostile takeover, and don't wait for a Wall Street Journal story. You don't need that. You can make the judgment. You have to act quickly. That's what you're going to do. But let's say you're under levered, but you're not under, under threat of a takeover. Why? Because you're a very big company, you have insider holdings, or you've done pretty well in the last few years. Or you have two classes of shares, and you control the game, corporate governance issues. Then you have the luxury of time. If you have the luxury of time, it's far better to increase your debt ratio gradually over time than try to do it all in one step. Why? Because if you make a mistake, at least you get a chance to, to fix it. So if you are under levered and you have time, then I'm going to ask you a follow-up question. Do you have good projects? That's a kind of stupid question to ask managers, because their answer always is, of course, 
So I'm not going to trust what you say, I'm going to look at what you've done. So here again, I'm going to look at your history to see if you've taken good projects. And here again, I'm going to draw on a measure we've already used in a different context. Remember when we computed the return on capital for a company and compared it to the cost of capital? In the case of Disney, we came up with a return on capital of 12.6%. Its cost of capital is 8.81% or 7.81%. We said if you earn a return on capital higher than your cost of capital, it means you're taking good projects. So when I look at whether you have good projects, I'm going to ask you that question, but then I'm also going to check the numbers. If your return on capital is higher than the cost of capital, then clearly you have access to projects that earn excess returns. So if you have good projects, here's my advice to you. You have a marriage made in heaven. You have excess debt capacity. You're under levered. You have good projects. And if you take those good projects with excess debt capacity, you get a double whammy. The first whammy is you move towards your optimal debt ratio. Your value increases because you've lowered your cost of capital. What happens when you take a good project? How do we define good projects in capital budgeting? They have a positive net present value, right? And when you take a project with a positive net present value, we said your value increases by that net present value. So you get that increase in value from going to your optimal, and you also get the net present value of those good projects. So if you have the luxury of time, take advantage of it. Look at whether you have good projects. Fund them with predominantly with debt. It doesn't have to be entirely with debt. And over time, you will get the benefits of both in moving towards your optimal and taking those good projects. If you don't have good projects, you've earned a return on capital less than the cost of capital, then my advice is find a way to increase your debt ratio gradually over time. And there are two ways, again, you can do it. One is you can borrow money and buy back stock every year and try to do this on a gradual basis over a five-year period. Or you can increase dividends substantially. You see why that's going to increase your debt ratio? Whenever a dividend gets paid out, I know we don't think of it in these terms, that's cash and equity leaving the company. Equity investors will see their market value decrease. They're not hurt by it because they get cash in their pocket to make up for it. So you can increase dividends over time and bring your debt ratio up. So that's if you have the luxury of time and you can work on it. So that's if you're an underlevered company and you can see the framework play out using things we've already measured in the company, the Jensen's Alpha, the return on capital that you've already computed. Any questions on underlevered firms and the pathway to the optimal? Let's turn to the, the worst problem is if you're overlevered. What if you have too much debt? If you have too much debt, again, the question I'm going to ask is how much time do you have? And here there's going to be a morbid ring to the question. Why? Because if you're overlevered, I'm not really worried about you being the target of a takeover. I'm worried about you going bankrupt. So the question I'm going to ask you is, are you under potential threat of bankruptcy? So what are some of the things I should look at to make this judgment? If you have an actual rating, I can look at your actual rating, right? And if I see a triple C there, no point devising five-year plans to get you out of this problem. You've got to do something quickly. If you don't have a rating, you can still make a judgment. If your interest coverage ratio is close to one, you're barely covering your interest expenses, you don't have the luxury of time. You need to do something quickly. So when you look at your firm and say, there is danger here lurking because I have too much debt. And you will always know when you have a firm which has too much debt, you will know. You know how you will know? You'll fly to visit the company. You land at an airport 30 miles away, and they'll ask you to walk. Said so no Uber, we can't cover that. No cab fare, you walk. You bring your own toilet paper with you, we have nothing here. You walk in this place, it's like a funeral home. Everybody's leaving at 9 a.m., not coming in. Company's in trouble, everything starts to unravel. So if you're in trouble, you need to bring your debt ratio down quickly. And this is one of the most difficult things to do in finance, is bring, in any business, is bringing your debt ratio down quickly. Because every plan you have is potentially going to be problematic. So let's say you have an overlevered firm. Overlevered to the point that bankruptcy looks. You need to bring the debt ratio down quickly. Give me some suggestions on what I can do. And I'll play devil's advocate and push back. Not because the suggestion is a bad one, but because in the world we operate, everybody knows you're in trouble. So what's the first thing you're going to try to do? If you have too much debt, you want to bring it down. I'm sorry? Sell assets, right? That's usually what some people say. Well, why don't you use the cash you have to pay down the debt? If I had a lot of cash, I wouldn't be in trouble in the first place. So remember, this is desperation time. So I should sell your assets. So what's the pushback on this? You try to sell your assets. 
Valiant's trying to sell all of its assets, right? And what is it getting? Lots of potential buyers? Everybody's stepping back from the table and saying, no, we're not really interested because we know you'll be back and you'll be more desperate the next time you're back. So the first thing that happens, if you try to sell your assets, you get not 100% of the value. You might get 80, 60, depending on how desperate you are. So selling assets is tough to do. I'm not saying it's impossible, but you can already see it. What's the second thing you could do to bring your debt ratio down? We'll go to that because in a sense, you say, why would the lenders even agree to stuff like that? That's truly desperation time. How about issuing equity? Right? That could bring your debt ratio down. What's the problem with issuing equity? Let's take Valiant. Valiant issue says it's going to issue 10 million shares next week. What's going to happen? You can say, who the heck is going to buy those shares? You're already dropping below 10 and going towards zero. I don't want to join this race to zero. So issuing equity sounds good on paper. But issuing equity when you're a disaster case is really tough to do. So you can't easily sell your assets. You can't easily issue equity. You know what the only thing you have going for you is? You could go bankrupt. So you use this to maximum advantage. Sounds like a perverse thing to do. But remember what we said happens once you go bankrupt? You end up in the legal system and the, the lawyers take it all. So you go to your lenders and you say, you know what, that one year loan we have, could we make it a 10 year loan, maybe even a 100 year loan? That 10% interest rate, could we just knock off the last zero and make it a 1% interest rate? You're saying, why would lenders agree to stuff like this? Because what do you threaten them with if they don't agree? If you don't agree, I'm going to go bankrupt. And then you're going to see nothing. It's a desperation ploy, but you're using it. You might even view it as amoral and unethical, but at this stage in the process, I'm not even caring about morality and ethics, I'm caring about survival. And survival almost always ends up dominating morality or ethics. It's amazing what terms borrowers can extract if they're viewed as desperate. One of my favorite stories of all time, late 1800s, a Latin American country, I don't know which one, because they all kept going bankrupt one after the other. Latin America is like the hotbed of of, of, bank, of sovereign bankruptcies, like 80% of all bankruptcies, just go to Latin America. Argentina alone will account for what? 15 of those bankruptcies. So it's late, eight, late 1800s, Latin American country declares bankruptcy. It owes money. It actually didn't declare bankruptcy. It actually owed money to a French bank and didn't have the money to pay the loan. So the time for them. I don't know in those days how you even told somebody, because remember these were days before phones, so you probably sent it by carrier pigeon. So the French bank says interest is due, and the Latin American country says, sorry, we don't have the money to pay the interest. But instead of paying interest, would you accept payment in bird droppings? You know, bird droppings are good fertilizer. They said, we have lots of bird droppings, guano. We can put them in big ships and send it to you instead of the interest payment. Initially, the French bank said, we don't take bird droppings. And the Latin American country said, would you like to take that or nothing? The French bank thought about it for a moment and said, put as many shiploads of bird droppings and send them to us. Now, you wonder why the Greeks didn't try this a few years ago, right? We pay in olive oil. How about wine? No? So you pay in kind. And again, the reason you get away with it is because people know that they don't accept this. This is the end. It's a way of playing that bankruptcy game to try to extract. And this is where restructurings come from, right? Because you walk into that room, you know that if you don't come to an agreement there, you're going to go bankrupt. That adds an incentive to lenders taking on equity in the company, even though they hate the company, even though they might not want the company to say, this is the best we can do, and you're extracting your best terms. So if your company has that much debt, and I would seriously doubt, because I try to steer you away from these companies by doing what? By asking you not to pick big money losers. Some of you have chosen to ignore my advice. <laughs> so at this stage in the process, use this to maximum advantage, right? You are potentially under threat of bankruptcy. Do the best you can. If you're not under threat of bankruptcy, you have the luxury of time. Remember, you can have too much debt and not be tipping over into bankruptcy. Then I'm going to ask you the same question I asked you when you had too little debt. Do you have good projects? And I'm going to look at the same metrics. What's your return on capital? What's your cost of capital? And if you have good projects, here's my advice to you. 
take all of the equity you generate as a company and put it into these projects. You're saying, what equity? Remember, you have retained earnings. That's retained earnings every year. So if you're paying dividends, stop. If you have too much debt, paying dividends and having too much debt is like having a weight problem going to McDonald's every two hours just to check out the menu. Nothing good can come out of this. So if you're paying dividends, stop paying the dividends. Take every last dollar of equity earnings, put it back into those projects. And if we're right, here's what's going to happen. Those are good projects, right? Your value of equity will rise. It's not because you're paying off the debt, but you essentially grow yourself out of the problem. Your debt ratio will decrease over time, not because your debt gets smaller, but because your equity gets larger. It's the best way to get out of a debt problem if you can. Of course, you could also be a company which has too much debt and not good projects, in which case, over time, you've got to take every dollar of equity earnings you have. Again, cut dividends to zero, put it into paying down the debt, and try to get back to a debt ratio. <clears throat> you can sustain. So if, you, if this sounds too abstract, make yourself, in your mind, the CEO of Value. Replace Joe Papa. And ask yourself what your, you know, what your, what actions you can take, because in a sense that's effectively where Valiant is right now, is trying to figure out how to bring their debt rate. They have 29 billion in debt. They can't have 29 billion debt. They can't afford it. But there's no easy way for them to bring the 29 billion to 20 or 15 billion, which is what they need to have to survive as a company. They're not quite at the tipping point of bankruptcy. They were a year ago. They seem to have avoided that. So maybe the most imminent threat has gone away, but it's really still something that has to be dealt with in the near term rather than in the long term. So any questions on this framework? Okay. So I'm going to try this on Disney. So let me go through the process. Is, if you remember with Disney, the optimal debt ratio I got was about 40%. Using the cost of capital approach, the APV approach, the sector comparison, it is an underlevered company. Is it a under potential threat of being taken over. Let's go through the list. Do you remember what the, the enterprise value for Disney was at the time we did this? It's about $130 billion. Not quite Microsoft, but not a small company. So one strike against a takeover. It's more difficult to take over a $130 billion firm. Does it have a lot of insider holdings? In fact, the two insiders are Lorene Jobs and George Lucas. And George Lucas will stab you in the back anyway. So you know, he didn't like the way you handled the Star Wars. I'm not sure he's your ally. You know. Lorene Jobs might or might not be your ally. You know, if I put a good environmental twist on my offer, maybe she'll come to my side. They're not exactly Steve Ballmer and Bill Gates in the case of Microsoft. So it's kind of a quasi strike against. You have some insiders, but they're more likely, they're not exactly insiders who are attached to. But here's the tipping point for me. Do you remember what the Jensen's Alpha was <coughs> for Disney? If anybody remembers, I will give you a copy of my newest book. Just give me a rough sense. Was it, first, was it positive or negative? Let's start easy. Positive, right? It was about 9%. The Jensen's Alpha was about 9% on an annualized basis. So it's done pretty well over the last five years. You think, so what? Doing a hostile takeover is going to be difficult to do if people think you're doing well. So in the case of Disney in 2016, I would say, or even in 2013 when these numbers were computed, not likely to be a takeover candidate. It's too big. It doesn't have enough in insider holdings. You know. And finally, that Jensen's Alpha is positive. Does it have good projects? Well, based at least on my return on capital, it looks like it's earning more than my cost of capital. And we have ma manifestations of what it's trying to do, right? The Shanghai theme park, the, the ex expansion of some of its, uh, of its movie businesses. So if it has good projects, the advice is go out and borrow money and use it to fund these projects. So the projects it took in 2014, 15, and 16, I would expect those projects to be disproportionately funded with debt. That's in 2013, but remember I said this is the fourth time I've done Disney. I'll take you through all four so you can see how my views on Disney have kind of evolved over time. Yes, go ahead. Let me hold off on that because next week when you talk about dividend policy, there's a very simple way. In fact, I'll give you a preview. I'm going to ask you how old are your stockholders? How rich are they? And by the time you answer those two questions, 
I can pretty much tell you whether they're going for dividends or price appreciation. You can see why, right? Older, poorer investors tend to prefer. And I put pension. So basically, you're looking at the kinds of investors who hold your stock. You can start to get a sense. And here's the other indicator. Do Google shareholders like dividends? It's a very easy question to answer. Don't even think about it too long. Do they like dividends? If they did, why would they be holding Google shares, right? The stock has never paid a dividend. Your history actually tells you a lot about what kind of stockholders you have. If you have a history of never paying dividends, guess what? You have stockholders who don't like dividends. There's a selection process that goes on in this game. If you're Verizon, you're trapped. Even if you say, I don't like to pay dividends, I have to reinvest money, you're trapped. And this is one of the things we'll come back and talk about in the context of dividend policy. And I'm going to coin a saying, I'm going to say again, which is you get the stockholders you deserve. Which is if you pay a lot of dividends, you get stockholders who like a lot of dividends. So we'll come back and examine that question. It's not a complicated question. In most companies, we should be able to answer that question. So in 1998, when I looked at Disney, it was a $70 billion company, which in 1998 was a pretty large market gap. Is Jensen's Alpha was a huge positive number. They'd done very well over the previous five years. It had no insider holdings. So that was the only strike against. So in 1998, I came to the same conclusion I did in 2013, borrow money and take projects. You move forward to 2003. I actually bought shares in Disney in 1998 because I wanted to feel the pain. And I felt a lot of pain over the next five years. In fact, its market cap between 1998 and 2000 dropped by a half. You know how difficult that was to do between 1998 and 2000? It's a dot-com boom. Companies are doubling their value without even trying. Disney was having its value. There were days in 2000 when I'd go to bed dreaming. Maybe during the night something bad will happen to Disney. It's managers, not to Disney, the company. That's my investment. And you could tell that, you know, we talked about this with Comcast, Ryan, but you could tell that Disney's management was getting more nervous. In 2002 or 2003, when I did my second edition, it was a very different game. Disney was down to being about a $35 billion company. You know? And it was now small enough that somebody could do a hostile with a negative Jensen Self and a CEO that everybody hated. This is a trifecta. You have a top management that nobody likes, you're doing badly, and your market cap has dropped. Disney was in play. In fact, you could tell. You can tell when companies get nervous. Michael Eisner started talking about how much he cared about shareholders. <laughs> so de that's usually a deadly sign that, that managers are scared if they start talking about shareholder wealth maximization. I still remember in the late 90s, you know, European companies thought they were immune from this hostile. They thought it was a, the, something that the Anglo-Saxon barbarians did is take over each other. That doesn't happen in Europe, civilized. Until you got Telecom Italia in 1998 or 99. One of the first large European companies to be acquired in a hostile acquisition funded with debt. You know what allowed it to happen? Until the mid-90s, if you tried a hostile acquisition of a European company funded with debt, guess where you had to go to get the debt? You had to go to a bank. Can you imagine borrowing from an Italian bank to try to take over Telecom Italia? It's not going to happen. What allowed that takeover to happen was the bond markets had opened up, and the acquirer, in this case Oliveri, was able to borrow money in the bond market and do the acquisition. It scared the heck out of CEOs across mainland Europe. And I remember about a year after the acquisition, I was in Europe on a panel. I was supposed to be the master of ceremonies for the panel, a role I absolutely hate playing, because you can't say what's on your mind. So you're going to kind of hold your tongue. So I was actually on this panel, and I was sitting next to the CEO of Siemens. So these were all European CEOs, and they were talking about the threat of hostile acquisitions. And the Siemens CEO gets up to the mic, and he says, at Siemens, we care deeply about our shareholders. And I almost fell out of my chair. And this is a company that's treated stockholders like mosquitoes for 100 years, swats them around, say, here's your dividend, get out of here. And all of a sudden, he's talking about how much he cares about shareholders. My reaction was exactly the same one I had when I heard Madonna sing like a virgin. <laughs> to which my reaction is, how do you know? What is the deeply repressed memory you're pulling out here? <laughs> so there are some CEOs who have absolutely no business talking about shareholder wealth maximization. 
But if they do, you know that there's something under the surface that's scaring the heck out of them. So if you're looking at your company, make your best judgment and don't be afraid to say, hey, you know what, this company could potentially be the target of a hostile, even if it has a big name. Big names don't stop you from being acquired. And at this stage, you're basically kind of tying that loose end up. So when you look at your company, here's what I'd like you to do. Look at the actual, look at the optimal. Then make a judgment as to whether you need to move quickly or gradually. And what's a judgment going to be based? If you're under levered, ask those questions about whether you're likely to be the target of a takeover. How big am I? You know, you know they're insider holdings. What's my Jensen's alpha? And if you're over levered, look at the threat of bankruptcy. And once you've made that decision of how quickly or gradually, then the second question I'm going to ask you is, how do you plan to change your debt ratio? And if you think about changing your debt ratio, you can play with the liability side, borrowing money to buy back stock or raising equity to retire debt, or do you want to do it by taking projects? And that question is going to be determined by do you have good projects or bad projects. So very quickly, if you have to change your debt ratio quickly, here are your choices. If you want to increase your debt ratio, you can sell operating assets and use the cash to, pay, to buy back stock or pay a special dividend. What does that do? It reduces your equity, it reduces your asset side, it raises your debt ratio. Or you can borrow money and buy back stock. So essentially you can see your two choices. One, you're staying on the liability side, recapitalization. The other is you're messing with the asset side as well. If you want to decrease the debt ratio quickly, then you sell assets and use the cash to pay down debt. And you can already think about how difficult that can be. Or you can try to issue new equity and try to raise the equity, and that's just as difficult. And that's why it's so much better to have a too little debt problem rather than a too much debt problem. Okay? Now, of course, if you have time, this process can be spread out over time. So if you want to get from a 10% debt ratio right now to a 40% debt ratio in five years, you have more freedom to make you know, small moves towards that 40%. It does become mechanically messier because if I ask you how do you get from 10 to 40% today, you essentially take the existing firm value and you work out the mechanics. But if it's going to happen over five years, the complication is your company size does not stay fixed over the next five years. It's going to change. Your equity value will change, your debt value will change. It's like hitting a moving target. If it sounds abstract, here's what I mean. If I have a billion dollar company today and I have 100 million in debt, I have a 10% debt ratio. If I want to get to a 40% debt ratio today, I need to get to roughly 400 billion, million, right? 40% of a billion. But if I want to get to 40% five years from now, and you ask me how much dollar debt will I need in five years to get to a 40% debt ratio, that's a tougher question to answer because I have to estimate what the value of your firm will be in five years, and it could be two and a half billion, or 1.8 billion, or 1.5 billion, and 40% of that will be a much larger number. It's, it's not difficult to do, but it's a little tedious. You have to actually project out the value of your company and think about your debt ratio in the future. So when you talk about changing debt ratios over time, remember the dollar debt that goes with a 40% debt ratio will be different if you have a five-year plan than if you're talking about changing your debt ratio right away. So that's the choice of how quickly or how gradually you plan to move to your optimum. Let's take the second half of this action process. Let's say you are under levered. You've decided you're going to borrow money, either gradually or over time, and I'm your investment banker. So I've convinced you you have excess debt capacity. I've convinced you you need to borrow money. So you ask me the question. You say, okay, you've convinced me. What type of debt should we issue? Do you see what, what the parameters here are? Long term or short term? What currency should the debt be in? Fixed rate or floating rate? Straight or convertible? And here's where I think a lot of investment banks make a serious mistake. They say, look, I can't do that. Our product people will be back next week to talk to you. And I leave the room. The minute I leave this room, all is lost from my perspective as the banker. Why? Because you are a company. You know you have excess debt capacity. You know you can, you're going to borrow money. You can wait a week for my product people to come. But while you're waiting the week, what else are you doing? reaching out to three other investment banks saying, hey, you know what, we have excess debt capacity, we plan to borrow money, why don't you come in with your product people? So a week later, by the time your product people come back, Goldman Sachs has beaten you to the punch, and then now going to, and remember, you don't get paid money for advice, you get made, paid money for the deal. So you've done the advice of advising them that they have excess debt capacity, but somebody else walks away with the sports. 
So what does it mean when somebody asks you what kind of debt should we issue, rise to the challenge, give it to them right there. And it's not complicated. Remember we said the objective is you want debt that matches up your assets. Let me start with that proposition and talk about why it has the pull that it has. Let's assume you have a firm whose value goes up and down. Well, you're a commodity company, you're a cyclical company, you have good times, you have bad times. So there's the value of your firm in that, that bold line. Let's say you borrow money whose value is fixed no matter what. This company is in trouble. You know when it, when it gets into trouble? Whenever the value of the, the assets drops below the debt, technically you're insolvent. You might survive, but you're in trouble. Why? Because the value of your firm falls below your debt. You say, so what? I'm going to take the same firm and restructure its debt to make a debt that moves with the firm value. Leave it to me. We'll discuss how we can make it do it. But let's say I can make the debt move with the firm value. So the value of the debt goes up. When firm value goes up, it goes down when firm value goes down. This firm has 50% more debt than the previous firm, but it never goes bankrupt. That's why you want to match debt up to the assets, is by matching debt up to the assets, you reduce default risk, and you increase your capacity to borrow money. So here's the first step. So here's the game we're going to play. You're a company, or I'll be the company, you be my advisors. I'm going to go through this process of designing the perfect bond for the company. Or you're going to design the perfect bond for me. So I come to you and say, what debt should I take on? You're allowed a series of questions, and your questions should be all about what kind of assets I have, what kind of projects I take. The first question you're going to ask me is, hey, how long term is a typical project for you? So if I'm Boeing, let's take Boeing as an example. I'm Boeing. When you ask me that question, what's a typical project for Boeing? How long term is it? It's probably had only, what, nine projects in its entire life. 707, 727, 737, 747, Dreamliner. When did they start thinking about the Dreamliner? The 1980s. That's when the original plans were drawn. Then they started the R&D. That took about 15 years before they got that all nailed down. Then they started building the assembly plants. Have you ever driven by a Boeing assembly plant? If you, you know, especially in, uh, near Seattle, you, these are huge, huge. They're like you know several football fields big. It takes about five, six years. Then they build the first Dreamliner and they deliver it. And what happens? All kinds of bad things start to happen. Right? The panels fall off. No plane that, that any, any of these companies makes is perfect, so it takes you about four or five years to iron out the problem. So about 20 years after you conceive the plane, the first plane rolls off the assembly line. And then if you're lucky, you can do what you did with the 747. The last 747 rolled off the assembly lines about 30 years after the first one. A typical project for Boeing can be 50, 60, 65 years if you count the R&D going all the way to the end of the project. So I'm Boeing, I ask you what type of debt, so what type of debt should I have in terms of duration? Really, really long term debt, right? Boeing was one of two companies in the late 90s that issued 100 year bonds. 100 year corporate bonds. You know what the other one was? It was Disney. We'll talk about Disney and talk about what aspect of Disney's business might require 100 year bonds. But you can see why Boeing will have 100 year bonds. Facebook recently started borrowing money. So let's say I'm Facebook and you're my banker and say, hey, what type of debt should I take in terms of duration? Typical project for Facebook? Probably two, three years. It's in a business where projects go cycle through. If you're Facebook, the last thing you want to do is take on 100-year debt because who knows what 100 years will deliver to you. So the right kind of debt for you as Facebook might be two to three-year debt. You have shorter-term projects. There are some things that Facebook does that might be much more long term. But if you think about a typical project for a technology company, much more short term, debt should be much more short term. So what, what's the duration of a project? So start thinking about your company and think about what's a typical project. For some of your companies, it's going to be easier than others. And here's why. If you're a Walmart or a Target, what's a typical project? It's another store, right? So basically, it's much easier to come up with a typical project for a company which has project after project that looks like the previous one. But if you're United Technologies or GE and I ask you what's a typical project, you can already see it's a much more difficult question to answer. And this is a question I'm going to have to face with Disney because depending on the part of Disney I look at, theme parks, movies, broadcasting, a typical project can have very different durations and the debt should be matched up to that duration. 
The second question I'm going to ask you is, what currency are your operations in? What do you get paid on? You see why this matters? If I'm advising Coca-Cola and I say, what kind of debt, and Coca-Cola asks me, what kind of debt should we take? I would expect a significant portion of Coca-Cola's debt to be foreign currency debt. No excuses here. If all of your debt is US dollar debt, it makes no sense because 40 to 45% of your revenues come from outside the US. So I'm going to look, in fact, I draw a pie chart of currency flows for a company. I draw a pie chart of its debt in currency. And if the pie charts don't match up, I'm going to push back and say, tell me why. The third question I'm going to ask you is, how much pricing power do you have? You see, what do you need to know? A company with significant pricing power is a much better candidate for floating rate debt than a company without pricing power. Let's see why. Think about how floating rate debt is structured. The interest rate on the debt is set up front, right? But it gets reset every year based on some prime rate, LIBOR rate, T-bond rate. So every year it gets reset. So if I take floating rate debt, my interest payments can increase substantially or drop substantially depending on what interest rates do over time. You're saying, so what? When you think about big moves in interest rates, big moves in interest rates don't come because the Fed actually changes policy. They come from inflation kind of taking off and the Fed losing control. So if inflation rises substantially and you have floating rate debt, I can almost guarantee you that the next time your interest rate gets reset, it's going to get reset at a much higher number. You think, no, that's, that's OK. It's OK if you have pricing power. Because if you have pricing power, what do you do then? Inflation goes up, your interest payments go up, your costs go up, you just pass it through to your customers as higher prices, you're OK. But if you don't have pricing power, you can see how dangerous it is to take floating rate debt. Because you take floating rate debt, inflation goes up, interest payments go up, and you don't have pricing power, and you can't pass it through you'd be in the worst possible shape because your costs will go up, your revenues will stay subdued, and you'll end up losing money. If you ask me, no airline should ever issue floating rate debt. Because flo airlines collectively have very little pricing power. They might join together and try to raise prices at the same time, but it's like trying to keep thieves together on the same page because somebody always breaks away and cuts prices somewhere, and the whole thing starts to kind of implode on them. So if you have pricing power, you're a much better candidate for floating rate debt. If you don't, I'm going to push you towards fixed rate debt. And I'm going to ask you a question about that financial asset balance sheet. Remember we talked about assets in place and growth assets? That some companies get the bulk of the value from growth assets, and some get the bulk of the value from assets in place. If the bulk of your value comes from growth assets, they're in the future, you're a much better candidate for convertible debt. And think of what? If you're a company with significant growth assets, you've got to reinvest all that you make back into the company to grow. You can't afford big interest payments right now. So what's the advantage of issuing convertible bonds if you're a Tesla or a Snap? You know what the Tesla does have convertible debt. You know what the coupon rate on the convertible debt is? It's about 1.5%. You say, why would you issue, borrow, lend money to Tesla? You're not lending because you think like a bond holder. You think about the option attached to the bond, and you're saying, this stock is going to infinity and beyond, so I'm going to buy the option. And that effectively means that your interest payments are low when you're a young growth company. And as you grow, the debt will get converted. And guess what? You can replace it with straight debt. That's 90% of debt design, right? How long term, what currency, fixed or floating rate, straight or convertible. Now is the part I can get creative. You say, tell me what else affects your cash flows, and I'll try to bring it into your debt. Thing like what? Let's say you're a gold mining company. What's the biggest factor driving your earnings every period? What's the thing you don't control? Gold prices, right? Gold prices go up, your earnings are up. Gold prices go down, your earnings are down. If I could design your bonds in such a way that when gold prices go up, you can make much bigger coupon payments. When gold prices go down, your coupon payments legally are lowered. That's going to kind of protect you against commodity prices moving and you being in trouble. In fact, these are not new. These are called commodity-linked bonds. The very first commodity-linked bonds were gold-linked bonds issued by a gold mining company in the early 1980s. There are lots of oil companies out there now that wish they'd issued oil-price-linked bonds, right? Those shale oil companies that went out and borrowed money when oil prices were 100. You're saying, why didn't they? Because they didn't want to share the equity, right? Because in a sense, what are you doing? You're sharing the good times with your bondholders. But the benefit you get is you can now borrow money and not worry about what if commodity prices drop through the floor. 
Here's another example. About 15 years ago, you know, somebody went through this class, went to work at Allstate, the insurance company. And about three months into her job, she calls all excited. She says, I just tried your optimal capital structure spreadsheet on us. We're hopelessly under level. I said, what do you plan to do about this? She said, I'm going to present this to the rest of the finance group. I said, tell me what happens after you presented it. So she calls and she says, you know, I presented it. They said, we know. So what, do you, what did they know? Said, we know we're under level, but we can't borrow the money. He said, they give you a reason. They said, they did. They, they said, we're always one disaster away from bankruptcy. A hurricane in Florida, an earthquake in California. We borrow money, we're going to be in big trouble. We cannot borrow the money because we're one disaster away from bankruptcy. So I'm going to ask you to be creative. I'm all state, I'm an insurance company. Or make me a smaller insurance company. I'm worried about this disaster risk. I'd like to borrow money because I'm leaving a lot of tax benefits on the table. Is there a way you could design bonds for me that's going to allow me to borrow money and not go under if there's a, bank, if there's a disaster? Let's make it mechanical. What would you like the bond to do to be able to protect me? You'd like to write a clause in there that says, if there's a disaster, and you can get a lawyer to write what a disaster is, and lawyers are very good about defining pretty much anything you want to find. A disaster is a hurricane that causes more than $10 billion worth of damage in Florida. A disaster is an earthquake that measures more than seven on the Richter scale. Then what happens? On the bond, your coupon payments will be legally suspended for two years after a disaster. And maybe even the principal payments could be shaved by 50%. These are called catastrophe bonds or cat bonds. They're issued almost exclusively by insurance companies. But you know, why would anybody buy the bond? Why would you buy this bond? What do you get out of this? Because obviously I can issue the bond, but somebody must be willing to buy the bond. Why are you buying this bond? What do, what do I give you in return? One is extremely high interest rate, and I'm also playing off the false sense of expertise that many people have. Like what? They say, I've read the Farmer's Almanac. It says there's no hurricane coming this year. <laughs> These guys are stupid. I'm going to buy the bonds. The reality is people think they're experts on things they're not even remotely familiar with the facts, and you're taking advantage of it by saying, you're an expert on hurricanes. Good. Buy our bonds. Okay? So essentially, you're not pulling a fast one. You're, you're, I mean, if you think about it, here's what you're doing. You're trying to issue a cross-dressing security, right? A security that behaves like debt with the tax guy and equity around you. The, because the b biggest advantage of debt is a tax advantage. The biggest advantage of equity is it's flexible. You're issuing a flexible <coughs> bond that allows you to get the tax benefits without putting your company's survival at risk. So that's, a, to me, the, the most interesting part of bond issue is creating the perfect bond for a company. The problem, though, is you let the product guy come in, and he opens his product box for you. Guess what bond he's going to find for you? He's going to find the bond that works best for him or her. I mean, it's, and that's what I don't understand. The, the, the people who are best suited to design this customized bond is you in the company. You understand your business, or you should understand your business more than some banker who steps in and says, hey, your perfect bond is always a floating rate convertible 20-year bond. And I think that's what I think companies have walked away from, is that responsibility of saying, we know our businesses. We're going to try to design the perfect bond for that business. You're saying, what if the perfect bond is so narrow you can't issue? That's fine. Then you can compromise and say, I cannot issue that bond. And you'll be amazed at how creative people have become on bond issues. I'll give you two examples. The company that used to manufacture swimming pools on the East Coast. That's their primary business. And a few years ago, they, if I find the news story that, that had this, I'll send it to you. They issued bonds where the coupon rate was tied to the temperature on the East Coast during the summer. You say, why? You're selling swimming pools. It's a cool summer. Your business is shot to hell. You issue bonds, and it's a cool summer. You could go bankrupt. You think, who buys those bonds? Again, there are people who are experts on pretty much everything. They say, I know what this summer is bringing. I'm going to buy these bonds. Here's the second example. It's a soccer team in Italy that had dropped out of the first, I don't know what the first division is in Italy, into the second division. They were building a stadium. And they were funding the stadium. 
And of course, their problem was if they stayed in the second division, didn't make it back to the first division, there was no way they were going to cover the cost of the stadium in terms of the interest rate. So they tied the coupon payment to whether the team made it back into the first division or stayed in the second division. And here's the advantage of being a sports team. You have fans, right? And what do the fans think about you? You're always going to make it back to the first division. You're taking advantage of your fans, I guess. But you're not holding a gun to their heads and you've got to buy our bond. So in a sense, you can see what being creative about your debt brings you. It brings you lower default risk and the capacity to borrow more money. So at this stage, you've got your perfect customized bond. And think about this for you, because it's actually a f it's really where you bring in everything you know to the company into that bond issue. And if you're a banker, the advantage of being creative and customizing debt is even though you might not be able to find a market for a small customized bond, if five companies in a row, you notice that there's a bond you could have issued that would have worked for that company, after the fifth company, you might stop and say, why shouldn't we be issuing these bonds? Don't let the fact that there isn't something already out in the market already stop you from trying to be creative. Lou Ranieri didn't look around and say, hey, nobody will issue bonds against housing, so I'm not going to issue bonds. He, of course, was the, the, the creator of the mortgage-backed security market. Because until the 1970s, people never even thought about the fact that he had hundreds of billions of dollars in mortgages that were sitting out there and nobody was raising. I mean, of course, the downside of that came in 2008. But you could see this happen with new bond issues. You find a need in the market, you're able to fill it in. Second step in the process, make sure you haven't been too clever for your own good. And think of why. What have you done? You've designed a bond that behaves like equity, right? In fact, you might have done such a good job that the tax guy says, you know what? That looks so much like equity. It is equity. In which case, all your hard work is down the drain. So your second stop is in the tax guy's office. They, I've designed this really creative bond. Will I be able to pass it off as debt? And the tax guy will open all his books. You know, he's got all these tax books. He'll work through and say, oh, maybe you will. Let's, try. Let's check it out. In fact, the IRS, you can check it out with the IRS. You can you know, say, this is a bond we're trying to issue. Would, and the IRS will send you a letter saying, well, we might treat it as debt, we might not, but, so, but that's about as good as you get. But at least you want to make sure that you are designing a security that still brings the tax benefits of debt. And this is also the stage in the process where you might massage the bond, give it features to maximize your tax benefits. Like what? If you're a European com company, you might figure out a way where you can put your debt in Germany rather than Ireland because that increases your tax benefits because the tax rate in Germany is 29.5%. The tax rate in Ireland is 12.5%. So you've designed your perfect bond, you've massaged it to maximize your tax benefits. Third step in the process, you have a really tough trick to pull off. When you borrow money, you have a group of people, groups of people that you've got to keep happy with contradictory objectives. And let's see why. Let's suppose I'm a Midwestern company. I plan to borrow money next week, issue bonds next week. So I fly out to New York. And here's my first stop. I stop at Moody's or S&P, the, the ratings agencies. Ratings agencies are focused on default risk. They worry about you going bankrupt. So when I describe the security I'm going to issue next week, am I going to describe it as debt or equity? What makes you happier as a, as a company that's focused on reducing default risk? You want me to issue equity. So I, say, I convince you that I'm issuing equity next week. You say, what's the big deal? Afternoon. I show up at the equity research analyst conference. Now, what do equity research analysts want me to issue? Debt or more shares? What happens if I issue more shares? The dilution bogeyman comes out of the closet saying, you can't do that, that's terrible. So, so I've got to convince the equity research analyst that what I'm going to issue next week is really debt. This is quite a trick, right? In the morning, I convinced the ratings agencies it was equity. Now it's magically become debt. Then I have a third stop to make if I'm a regulated company, an insurance company, an investment bank, or a bank. The regulatory authorities worry about regulatory capital, and we've already talked about how regulatory capital is measured. It's using equity. The more equity I have, the more capitalized I have. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take that same security I told you was equity in the morning, became debt in the afternoon, and make it back into equity in the evening. You see, you think I can pull this off? There's no harm trying. And bankers, in my view, 
about a third of the income generated from bankers comes from threading the needle that different definitions allow them to do to pull this trick off. I'll give you an example. This is about 25 years ago. The security that was invented called trust preferred stock. I'm going to describe how trust preferred works. I want you to think in terms of finance 101 and tell me whether it looks more like debt or equity to which bucket you're going to put into. So here's how trust preferred works. It comes with a fixed dividend that's set at the time of the issue. Second, that fixed dividend is tax deductible. And third, if I fail to make that fixed dividend, I've got to give you voting rights. Fixed dividend, tax deductible, got to give voting rights. If you think of it in terms of debt versus equity, remember that contrast we drew? Where do you think this fits? Fixed dividend, tax deductible, voting rights. Would you put it in the debt box or the equity box? It looks like debt to me. For whatever reason, when this was created, the banker who created this, should probably get a Nobel Prize for pulling this off, managed to convince the ratings agencies to treat it as equity. See how magical this is? You're borrowing money, and as you're borrowing money, what's happening to your rating? It's going up. This is the best of both worlds, right? So I actually talked to the, one of the people in the committee at one of the ratings agencies that classified this as equity, and I asked, why would you do something like this? It makes no sense. And he gave me two reasons, one incredibly stupid and one mildly stupid. I'll give you the incredibly stupid reason first. He said it was called preferred stock. You see the opening he's given us? Let's go on a renaming convention of the balance sheet. Those bank loans, no, 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 we don't call them loans anymore. We call them bank preferred stock. You can't go around classifying something as debt or equity based on what I call it. That is the incredibly stupid reason, in case you're wondering. Here's the mildly stupid reason. He said equity usually is a security with no maturity, so it's in perpetual. Debt usually has a finite maturity. Trust preferred stock does not have a maturity. Therefore, it's more like equity than debt. Sounds mildly plausible, right? But how long did I say Boeing and Disney bonds were for? What, what is the maturity in those bonds? 100-year bonds. Let's say you buy a 100-year bond at issue. Unless you're an incredibly optimistic person, you're not going to be around to collect the face value, right? At which point I'm saying, why not the 1,000-year bond, a 10,000-year bond, a forever bond? In fact, the British and the Canadian governments used to have console bonds. These were bonds that did not have a maturity date. They lasted forever. So if your definition of something being equity is it doesn't have a maturity date, my advice to Boeing is you've already gone to 100 years. Just make your bonds forever. The benefit you'll get is it'll be treated as equity. You might have to pay a slightly higher interest rate, but I'll take that if you classify it as equity. But in the early 90s when this happened, it was like a godsend for investment banks. Why? Because the commissions you got on trust preferred securities was about 10 times larger than what you got on bonds or issuing straight equity. So if you're a client, in 1993, you walk in an investment bank, and I'm the junior banker, I've been told, sell trust preferred stock to every person who walks through that door. Doesn't matter who it is. Tell them that this is the best security ever. I know I'm doing the wrong thing, but I want this job. I don't want to get fired. So I have to sell trust preferred. But I want to do the least permanent damage I can while I'm doing this. So I have a question for you. If I'm trying to sell trust preferred, a company with all the features that I just described what is the group of companies where it's going to do less damage firms that are under levered that are choosing not to go to their optimal remember we talked about rating constraints that companies have rating. maybe there's a company that can be at 40 percent debt but stops at 20 percent because if it goes to 40 percent its rating will drop to a minus and it doesn't want that so that's the first group under levered firms that have a rating constraint or maybe over-levered firms that can't borrow money the traditional way because they're over-levered, but they can pull this off because it's kind of tricky. They're, you're issuing debt and nobody knows you're issuing debt. Which group do you think is a better candidate for selling trust preferred to if you want to do less damage in the long term? The under-levered or the over-levered? A lot of under. I want to pick somebody who said over-levered and pick on them. You want to try over lever? So tell me why you want an over levered firm to issue trust preferred. From the perspective of the company, it's more responsible. Okay, so you issue the trust preferred, you fool the ratings agency, right? You think this is good? 
Well, I borrowed the money, nobody knows it. When you borrow money, there's always one person who knows you borrowed money. You know who it is? The person who lent you the money. The only consolation prize you will have is you can go bankrupt with a really good rating. <laughs> because you fooled the rating agency, and that I think is what I want to point out. This is not a game. You can fool the ratings agency, but you cannot fool the fortress. Eventually, if you don't have the money to make your interest payments, which made you over levered in the first place, the last thing I should be doing is adding more contractual payments on top of that and saying, hey, try to pull it off. It's an incredibly dangerous game, but banks and companies play, have played this for the last 25 years. And it gets almost ridiculous because what the, com what, the, what the company is trying to do is separate itself from its debt to the point that people don't know it's borrowed money. So trust preferred was the first step away from your debt. And then when eventually the ratings agencies caught on and started treating it more like debt than equity, you created an even more complex security that gave you, so you got another two years out of the need. It's almost like six degrees of separation between a company and its own debt. And if you separate yourself enough from your debt, there will be a point of time where you look like Enron. In what way? I'm convinced in 1999, if you'd walked into Enron, you walked into the CFO's office and say, Jeff Skilling's office, and say, how much debt do you owe? He wouldn't have known the answer. They'd done such a good job of separating themselves from their own debt, they wouldn't have known how much money they owed as a company. And that's an extraordinarily dangerous place to be as a company. Because if I ask you, if you, do you have too much debt, what's your answer? I have no idea. I don't even know how much I owe. So that's, I think, the only caveat. The advice I would offer is don't make this about getting a better rating and fooling the rating agency. That might be part of your game, but it cannot be your central game. You have to think about, can we afford to borrow the money? So now you're almost ready. You've got the perfect bond. You've got the tax OK. You, you, you kind of. At least you're keeping these different groups reasonably happy. Nobody's really pissed off at you. You get ready to issue the bond. Nobody will buy your bonds. You Saying why not? Well, because either because you have no history in the bond market, you've never issued a bond, or you have the wrong history in the bond market. No history is easy. When a company goes in the bond market for the first time, bond investors are a little wary. They're saying, I don't know whether this, this company can pull this off. Or the wrong history is even more interesting. We talked about the RJR Nabisco case very early in this class. How in 1988 they ripped off their bondholders and the company was taken private. Four years later it came back public and it tried to issue bonds. And nobody would buy its bonds. Because they remembered bond markets are much longer memories than stock markets. In stock markets everybody forgets everything right away. But bond markets, they, they hold on to grudges. So I remember what you did to us in 88. So if nobody will buy your bonds, guess what you have to do? You have to sugarcoat the bonds to make them acceptable to bondholders. Add protections so that they will buy your bonds. Let me be specific. In the Nabisco case, remember that what made those bonds so easy, I mean, so bondholders so easy to rip off is they didn't leverage buyout, and the rating changed, and they didn't have to change the interest rate. So post Nabisco, you had to put puts on the bonds, not because you wanted to, but because if you didn't put them, nobody would buy those bonds from you. So you add these special protections, not because you want to offer it, but without it, you're going to be charged a really high interest rate. So that's why when you see conversion features in bonds and special components, that's a sign that this is a company that the bond market doesn't trust. They're adding these features to make them more trustworthy. Which brings me to the final step. So you now designed the perfect bond. You've sugar-coated it. You're ready to issue the bond. Last piece of advice, don't lock in market mistakes that work against you. Let me explain. Let's assume you're an infrastructure company, long-term assets. You're, the right kind of debt for you is 30-year bonds, fixed rate. You get ready to issue the bonds, and you notice something. Your actual bond rating is triple B, but you believe you should be double A rated. You think that the ratings agencies have really underrated you. You see why you might not want to issue those 30-year bonds today? If you issue those 30-year bonds to the extent that the bond market trusts the ratings agency, you're paying too high an interest rate and you're locking it in for the next 30 years. You think, what do I do? Issue short-term debt, try to convince the ratings agencies that they're wrong. Or convince the bond market that the ratings agency is wrong. 
Maybe it won't work, but you don't want lock and market mistakes that work against you. You want to look at the other side of the transaction because it's morally, it, well, now we're going to go into, into ground that might make you feel you know, a little morally conflicted. Let's say you're an overrated company. What do I mean? You really should be a double B rated company, but the rating agency has given you a single A rating. What might you be tempted to do? Issue as much long term debt as you can, lock in the rate, and when the bottom falls out, as it eventually will say, we never saw this coming. In the late 90s, that's what telecom companies did in the, in the US. They went on issued debt. Not even because, they didn't need the money. They issued it because they knew they were getting a rate that was too low for them. The only problem was once that cash came into the company, if they just left it as cash, everything would have been okay. You could have lived with that. But once you get that cash, what are you tempted to do as a company? Really stupid things. And that, I think, is the quandary you face is when somebody, and this actually, you know, let's suppose Elon Musk calls you tonight. He says, look, you know, I don't trust any of these bankers who are advising me. You're the person I want to ask you this question because I know you're not going to blab to the media. And he says, is anybody in the room with you? He said, no, 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 we're, al we're alone. Say, this $305 per share for Tesla, it's way too high. We should really be a $150 share company. Should I go out and re issue a billion shares right now? Or a hundred million shares? What's your answer to that? I mean, clearly he knows that his stock is overvalued. Should he raise the money at that overvalued price? Let's separate into two parts. He does have to build those assembly plants for the Tesla 3, right? He needs the money. So let's say he needs a billion dollars for that, or two billion. My answer is, of course, go and raise this, the money because you have to raise the capital. It's not your job to talk the stock price down or talk the stock price up. Raise it at $305 per share, build those assembly plants. But let's say the one billion is all you need. Should you raise the extra four billion? My, my advice always has been don't do it because here's what's going to happen. The people who buy these shares at $305 per share are still going to be a shareholders a year from now when the stock price comes back to 150 and they're going to be really pissed off so you need the capital, even if you feel your stock price is too high, I think you should go out and raise the capital. It's not your job to say, we're not going to raise capital because our stock price is too high. But if you raise more than that, then I think the question you've got to ask yourself is, do I want to live with the consequences of that in my shareholder meetings for the next three, four, or five years? And a lot of tech companies right now are facing that question because they feel internally that their stock price is too high. They will never admit to it in public. They can't do it. But internally, I'm sure these discussions are going on, say, hey, things are looking really good for the moment. Should we go out and raise as much capital? And it's not just public companies. If you're Uber, at a $71 billion pricing that you have right now, if you're worried about the bottom falling out, that your losses are not going to get smaller, you're going to go out and raise as much capital as you can at the prevailing price because you want to make sure that you cover your capital needs. But when you go beyond that, then I think you're asking for trouble. So if I were to, so don't worry about this page. I just took the previous six pages, put them all into one page. Originally, it was just one page, and I said, no way can I even pull this off. Okay. But basically, this puts all the steps together. Start off by designing the perfect debt, and that always starts with the company and works out. Stop with the tax guy and make sure that the debt you've issued provides you the tax benefits. Try to keep these different groups happy, equity research analysts, rating agencies, regulators. Sugarcoat the debt if needed to make it acceptable to bondholders. Check to make sure you're not locking in market mistakes that work against you. And if you're taking advantage of market mistakes, don't get too carried away because it can hurt you. And you got your perfect bond issue. And for this, I don't see why you need consultants. If you're a company and you want to do this, you are in fact in the best position to take this to the process. Maybe there are stages in the process where you need advice. But you should stay in control of this process rather than turning it over to a consultant bank and say, tell me what the right kind of debt is and I will go out and borrow it because no bank or consultant should ever be able to understand your business better than you can. So I'm going to please start the next step in the process. Now, how to design this perfect bond? We can talk in generic terms. So if you want something more specific, there are three ways I can take you through designing the perfect debt. 
The first is what I call intuitive, and this is the approach I'm going to push on you. You know your business, start building the perfect debt for your company, whether it's a gold mining company or an insurance company, by looking at what the company's projects look like. Then I'm going to give you a quantitative way where if you can give me the cash flows on a project, like the Disney theme park, I will actually design debt for you based on your cash flows. And the third is I'm going to look at the entire firm over its history, and based on your company's history, draw some lessons that I can use to say how long term your debt should be, how much of your debt should be in a foreign currency. So let's start with the intuitive approach for Disney, because I think this is, to me, the building block for all of debt. Disney, I have all these different businesses, and there is no one debt issue that's going to work with all of them. So let me take each business that Disney is in and design the perfect debt for that business. Let's start with the movie business. A typical movie project is probably three, four, five years. To, and at least until very recently, much of that was for the US. That's starting to change. If you look at a typical movie for Disney, they're getting about half their gate receipts now from outside the US. But movie projects are short term. Current cash flows are in a, in a mix of currencies. You see the Furious, the eighth, you know, opened to what, $530 million, or so probably one of the worst movies ever made. I watched little pieces, I couldn't even take the 10 minutes that I watched. Yeah. But it's a movie that's going to make a lot of money, and much of it is going to come from outside the US, because you, it doesn't matter what language you speak, you really don't need to understand a word that's spoken. <laughs> if you've ever driven a car and you like driving really fast, there's a movie for you, right? But the reality is that the, current, the mix of currencies you're going to see will reflect the type of movie. Action movies will be more, you know, more of your revenues come from outside than an animated movie. And one of the features of the movie business is a heavily skewed distribution. Here's what I mean by this. At the end of every summer, they will list out the movies that came out during the summer. And every summer, this is always true, the top five movies will account for about 90% of the gate receipts over the summer. And the rest of the movies, now the 50, 60, 70, will just come and go and not even make a dent. That's why you can go onto Netflix and look at it. I've never heard of this movie, never seen this one. Right? It makes Netflix click, right? All those movies that don't make it. So th that's the reality of the business. A few really big hits and lots of small losers. So if you are designing the perfect debt for the movie business, it's probably be short term. Maybe three year debt, five year debt. Probably a mix of currencies, depending on whether you're producing an action movie or uh, you know, independent kind of deep thinking movie. And if you could, you'd like to tie the coupon rate on the movie to how well the movie does, right? Especially if it's a big budget movie. The Star Wars bonds, you know, if you to tie them to how well the next Star Wars is doing. You know? So to the degree that you can pass the risk through, especially if you're it might not be necessary for a company like Disney, that's a big company, lots of different business. But if you're a Lionsgate, do you see why this makes a big difference? You produce one big movie every year or two. Your entire fate rests on that movie. I would argue that maybe you should tie your bond coupons to how well or badly that movie does. So that's a movie business. If you go to the broadcasting business, typically short term, primarily in dollars, though the foreign component they're hoping will grow and driven by advertising revenues. Or ra in this case, you're driven by ratings, but not bond ratings, but Nielsen ratings. If you could tie a bond, short-term bond, primarily dollar-based, if you could tie the coupon rate or the features of the bond to how well your show does, good work. You can't even say, who'd buy these bonds? I'd remind you of Bowie bonds. Have you ever heard of, Bo You've heard of David Bowie, right? Got his spiky hairs. He died, what, last year? The early 1990s, David Bowie had a fight with his record companies, and he bought back the rights to all of his music, which left him with a cash flow problem. Rock star cash flow problem tend not to go together. So here's what he did. He approached a banker in New York who took all of his songs, bundled them together, and issued what were called Bowie bonds. And what made them unique was the coupon rate on Bowie bonds was tied to how many, these were the old days when you actually sold records in record stores, how many of his records went platinum, so basically how many records he sold. So if he sold a lot of records, the coupon rate rose as high as 15%. If tomorrow we all woke up and said, David Bowie, terrible singer, I'm not buying a record of his, the coupon rate actually dropped to 0%. If people will buy Bowie bonds, why wouldn't they buy your bonds? No? So if you're trying to design the perfect bond, go ahead. 
Last piece of the Disney business, this is really the only business where I can see a 100-year bond making sense, is those theme parks, right? Really long-term, mix of currencies, and increasingly it's foreign, right? And all the new theme parks that are being built in Shanghai, in Hong Kong, who knows where the next, where the next one is, maybe in Rio. So long-term, and if you could, currency mix that reflects where the tourists come from. So when we start on Wednesday, we will actually start talking about one more way of actually making this more explicit. But you have the foundation for actually doing this for your company. So in a sense, you've got to start digging on what's allowed them to succeed, what do they do that's unique or different, and then start building your resumes you can. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Professor, yeah. um, so I think yeah. just a little comment, but I have to leave yeah. as well. Um, the only issue I have is I actually have a competing mark in my team. I think. Is there any way we can work out a deal where we get to come an hour later? Or no, I think we can do that. OK, perfect. I can email you. Just email me. Perfect. Thank you so much. Really OK, sure. Take care. Hi, so uh, on this quiz, I got the same answer as the solution in the video, and I checked the other version solution, and uh, there was a 4 million in it, so I think I might have used the wrong Okay. Hi. Um, feel free to say no to this, but um, I know next Wednesday, not this, a week from Wednesday is our, uh, is our quiz. Um, I was wondering if there's a talk I was really hoping to see coming from 9 to 11. 